Chipped ham and football, that's what Pittsburgh does. This is the PG Sports Now show from the Post-Gazette. Brian Batka with you here after spending the weekend in sunny L.A. where this man lives full-time. You can hear him on the Minus 3 podcast, Extra Points podcast from Omaha Productions, all sorts of other cool stuff. And most importantly, as you can see, he's a Pittsburgh native. If you didn't already know that, it's Dave Damashek. Dave, how was your trip to SoFi Stadium Sunday for Steelers-Rams? Well, it was long, but not as long as your sojourn from the banks to the Three Rivers to LAX and then to the stadium and then getting back out of the stadium. Overall, though, it was worth the effort. I'm sure we can both agree. Uh, big fan. Uh, big thrilled to uh, get the kibitz with you back. Go about all things black and gold. By the way, speaking of black and gold, I'm going to plug very quickly. Me and Ryan Shazier do a show once a week called Don't Call It a Comeback. Stillers fans will enjoy that one. I saw a lot of a lot of 50s walking around outside uh, SoFi Stadium before and after the game. Absolutely. You could probably see just about every Steelers jersey walking out there because there were You're so right. many Steelers fans in the place. We're going to get into that and all sorts of other fun stuff on this episode. Presented by Pella. No better place to get new windows and doors installed in your home than Pella, who can help you save on your energy costs year-round, schedule a free in-home consultation with your local Pella windows and doors to find the right product for your home and budget. Give them a call at 866-593-1560 to discuss your project. That's 866-593-1560 to get started planning your new window and doors installation with Pella windows and doors of Pittsburgh. So yeah, Dave, uh, I guess just first impressions of it. I mean, it was Steelers Nation West again. I mean, it never really gets old. I was in Houston where there was a decent amount. I was in Vegas where there were a ton of them. And there were even more Steelers fans who took over the Rams house on Sunday. That that had to be fun for you to see as a as a transplant out there. And uh, probably had to feel for the players and coaches too, a little bit like a, a home game away from home. Yeah, no surprise, of course, to you or me. If we, you, you, when you go to any of those venues, they are populated in an outsized uh, percentage by black and gold wares. Um, yeah, it, it really is weird, and 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 not to be saccharine right out of the gate, but I got to tell you, you know, listen, people connect with things. We all want that sort of sense of community and all that, the the Cheers theme song and <laughs> and all of that. Well, it doesn't have to be, I guess, after all the the four-walled cellar somewhere in Boston where everybody knows your name, 3,000 miles away from Pittsburgh, PA. You felt familiar with everybody because as you walked by, people wanted high fives and otherwise, and that's a neat sense of community. And then, of course, um, you know, I grew up steeped in Steelers and all things Pittsburgh because of my old man and my extended family. And, uh, you know, this was my first trip. You know, my late old man passed away about two, three months ago. And he used to say for decades that, you know, it would have been a nightmare for him on Sunday morning because the Pitt Panthers lost in heartbreaking tough fashion one, tough one and the Penguins them. lost on Monday night. Well, the old man always pointed out, you know, what happens on autumn Saturdays to Pitt and the Penguins is what tells you is going to happen to the Steelers on Sunday. Maybe he took that one with him. I don't know. Maybe that was his last gift to me was to take that. And then I got to take my boy and he got to see it. And he's not from LF, not from uh, Pittsburgh, but he gets it. And uh, it, it's fun. And like I say, you can, you can make fun at me. I'm a grown man. I deserve the teasing, but um, it does feel, uh, it does feel cool um, that, that, uh, that so many people seem to latch on to the same um, to the same thing. And, you know, you could tell Batco, I'm sure those people, the misconception is, I think that the Pittsburgh airport has like, uh, <laughs> has like 40,000 people in it on Friday and Saturday flying We're all getting on planes to go there. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I think the greater compliment is the reality, which is that back in the seventies, prior to the Celtics and Lakers becoming the two dynasties of that sport, in the 70s, it really was Steelers or Cowboys, and you must choose one <laughs> or the other. Hate that, hate the, the team that is the rival. And then you were allowed to root for whatever your local football collective was as well. I've met so many people about, like, well, you know, I grew up, uh, I was a Dolphins fan, but, you know, I love those Steelers. Though. And I get <laughs> people always have a play, and that's, uh, you know, in, in the year of the Lord 2023, it still seems to matter. For sure. And maybe it was divine intervention from your pops that Pitt loses on a controversial uh, inch line call. And then the Steelers get it from their quarterback on a controversial mm -hmm. game of inches 
type sneak by Kenny Pickett. Let's uh, let's get into some of the game, Dave. I want you to start by breaking down the intricacies of Isaac Sayamalo's performance at left guard. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, should should we start with I don't know TJ Watt, Mike Tomlin, weirdness of the AFC North now? Like where do we go from here with that game 24-17 against the Rams? In which, yeah, I guess we can start with TJ. I mean, his pick really was the the shot that they needed to start that second half. I was actually still chowing down on empanadas in the press box when that happened, which tells you how sudden it was. Like, I, I like getting the national perspective from you, somebody who's out there in LA where the Steelers, maybe that perpetually above average, slightly Steelers might be out of sight, out of mind for a lot of folks, but doing what you do, hobnobbing with all the big wig NFL national analysts that you do, mm. does, is TJ mm. still somehow under the radar or maybe underappreciated. I mean, he's got one defensive player of the year trophy in his, in his case, but like, I still feel like he doesn't quite get the buzz of some of the other top guys. And yet this is what he does every week. Well, specific to, yeah, that there is, I do feel that provincial pride in Watt. And then the, the, what seems to always happen now in this era is then if you as a fan base don't feel like our guys getting enough, then people feel offended by that. And and maybe there is some validity to it where it's concerned because Miles Garrett does get a tick more shine, right? Yeah. I mean, like TJ Watt is understood to be a star. He's in all the NFL promos that you see on TV. But you're right. When you see, I mean, betting odds, I didn't look at them since um, week seven wrapped, but I, without looking, I bet you Miles Garrett has shorter odds to win Defensive Player of the Year right now. I think a lot of people would hold up Nick Bosa, but I would say to those people, um, "Hey, uh, have you ever seen Miles Garrett or Nick Bosa do what what T.J. Watt did to start the second half? I mean, dropping in coverage and essentially duping the Hall of Fame QB into a throw and picking it off and nearly running it in." Obviously, dynamite stuff. The thing that occurs to me, if you say, "What? What about the game?" You know, where that whole play starts for me is at the coin flip before the game. And I'll, I'll tell you, I know people like to get down on Coach Tomlin. We're going to talk about enough. him in a second. Yeah, for sure. He don't win enough games, dude. <laughs> I don't know what's up with that, dude. But okay, <laughs> the the cynicism of uh, uh, against Mike Tomlin is weird in my book. But um, what is valid it, it, to me is, this 31 other pro football teams now understand what's going on here. When you win the toss, that is a gift to you to receive the ball at the start of the second half, not the first. And I assume, and the vibe I get from Tomlin is that we're, we're, we're looking to impose our will early and set the tone for this game and everything else. You know, first of all, it ignores that the Steelers have got to be the worst um, <laughs> first possession team in pro football, but also, no, no, no matter where you are in that hierarchy, obviously the math suggests that it's wiser to take the ball at the start of the second half. And I literally, as you're eating empanadas, I say, I'm saying to my boy, Jean-Claude Van Damashek next to me, see, this is why I bellyache about coach <laughs> Tomlin taking the coin flip and then receiving to start the game. And now the Rams have the ball and the Steelers are down six. And should the Rams put a drive together here right out of the gate and even end it with three shame the devil. If it's seven, the game is over. You know, the Steelers as structured are and as wired and philosophically um, the way Tomlin approaches things these days, they're not, a, a big two score down rally in the second half kind of team. And I said, so Tomlin, what he's thinking, and I'm explaining this to my boy in hopefully not as long winded a fashion as I am for you now. But I said, and you know what Tomlin's thinking about? This is what he likes. And he thinks that in terms of field position, he now has the Rams backed up and he seeks a turnover in this spot. And as I say, he seeks a tur turnover in this spot is when the ball hits DJ Watt in the hand. So I think I look prescient, but I was kind of, vaguely uh, miffed because I was like, see, don't cheer. Don't anybody cheer because this is only going to encourage more of this behavior from Mike Tomlin. But it worked out in this occasion, so I was happy. It did. I mean, just T.J. Watt bailing out the Steelers and his coach, his, his offense in, in many fashions, week in and, and week out. It always does seem to happen that way. And and, and speaking of Tomlin, I mean, the, the decision that you just brought up was a bit confounding. Um, and it's weird to say this after a game in which that happened. 
his team, specifically his uh, mercurial wide receivers, <laughs> committed some very undisciplined penalties and in which he lost a challenge uh, on the Puka Nakua catch. Oh, man, my first time saying that. Oh, uh, it's a delight, today. isn't? Say yeah, it as often it as you can. Stretch it out. Puka it Nakua! Boy, Tom what L- a, uh, that guy is, huh? Yeah, yes, he is. Tomlin loses the challenge on the Puka Nakua catch. And, uh, you know, he certainly benefited from some Sean McVay blunders on, on that sideline. But do you think it, at 4-2, and two, in which the Steelers, you know, arguably got outplayed in three of those four wins, and yet they're here... Do you think he's going to start gaining some buzz or some traction for that elusive coach of the year honor among the the talking heads at ESPN and NFL Network and all those places? I, I, like, I don't know if Tom was doing a good job or a bad coaching job right now, the fact that they're four and two and they've gotten there this way. It's a weird thing. The national media and the NFL, you know, at the player level, and it certainly seems at the coach's level, across the board, uh, wild respect and affection for Mike Tomlin. It's the local media, not across the board, the, the Pittsburgh media, it feels yeah, but like- that's what I was getting at, yeah. There are plenty of cynics in his midst, and then plenty more cynics in the stands, probably informed by the, uh, the performatively um, <laughs> doom and gloom media members who like to who like to push that agenda now listen i will turn again i, I don't want to sound uh you know pie in the sky optimist i'm i'm recurringly put in this weird spot which is uncomfortable for me i am a glass half full a glass half empty soul and yet when i hear a lot of pittsburgh <laughs> media members talk i think like now you've jammed me into a place i don't want to be where i have to try and be optimistic about all this i mean tomlin here's the thing and it's pretty clear. If he had his wish, the Steelers wouldn't just win. They would win every game 12 to 11. Yeah. And so every game, when he turns every game into a knuckleball, it's going to be unsatisfying from our side too, right? I mean, like if, you know, splash plays for some teams are, you know, you you get them, but you're, they're counted on a few times over the course of the game, even in the two high, say, you know, the, the, the two safeties dropped deep to prevent Uh, deep shots from Patrick Mahomes and the superhero level quarterbacks, you still get splash plays from the high end teams. If the Steelers get one of those, I mean, I know it's anecdotal at this point, but three of those wins, think about them. And if you count TJ Watts pick there at the start of the second half, four splash plays, if they get one of those based on the way they approach games, they've won three or four of those games. And when they haven't gotten them, they're 0 and 2. So maybe there's something that you can glean from that longer term. Um, I, You know, I think Tomlin does need to have his foot on the gas a little bit more given the flow of pro football, the advantages that offenses have and everything else. But then again, devil's damashecking what I just said. I see a lot of stuff about like, hey, don't get too excited, Steelers fans, because imagine (laughs) where you'd be without TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith. Like, well, I don't know. Are we allowed to play that game? Like, <laughs> right, like, yeah. Hey, Chief, don't get too excited because if I take uh, Chris Jones and Travis Kelsey <laughs> away, where are you going to be? Not as good as it turns out. That's what's going to happen. Your high end players tend to swing games. I do think Tomlin in uh, does believe that he doesn't have, you know, the idea of a seventy six Steelers or eighty five Bears. And at, at this point, like, you're not going to keep a team to single digits consistently, no matter how dominant your pieces are. But I do think in the twenty first century, what he seeks is splash plays from the defense. Minka Fitzpatrick, and by the way, if you think about it, like regret, uh, what, what what do they say? Regression um, to the mean, turnover regress, mean, regression, that, take away. That. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't pay attention in math. I don't like <laughs> I was, I resented it after multiplication, but what I do know is like, they always talk about the regret. Minka Fitzpatrick hasn't made splash plays yet. You have to assume that's coming. And so based on that, I think there's some cause for optimism for, you know, how many times can TJ Watt save them? Well, he happens to be one of the five best non quarterbacks in pro football. So you hope a lot is the answer um, based on the way they approach it. And by the way, based on the evidence you saw in 2022, I always look back and say, what they did in Cincy in week one with TJ Watt out there a full year and two months ago now uh, is the premise for what Mike Tomlin wants to do. Now he wants to turn every game ugly. 
He wants to turn you over, not just, not, I mean, the, the, the ability to just dominate and smother. No, but to take away one possession or maybe two over the course of 60 minutes from those high end offenses in, is enough in his head to swing these games. And you do have to say from the Duck Hodges to Roethlisberger, uh, the one extra year to Trubisky that, against the Bengals last year and since he, yeah, he does. And they do have a knack of stealing those games against more talented teams. But to where I started this monologue three minutes ago, I do think this is the season where it does have to turn. Or then even I will start to have some questions here because, you know, it was all a build. Okay, we have the le- we, we have the legend who makes a legendarily high dollar figure at QB. Then, okay, we're going to bring you back on a cheaper rate, but we're really not going to be able to do a ton with the roster. Okay, now we drafted a QB, start of a new era, build it up, new GM, all of that. It does feel like this team is close to ripe. I don't think this is as good as it's going to get. I think 24 and 25 are the sweet spot, but they do need to show that they're playing 21st century ball and can keep up with the big boys enough to get the double digit wins, which I think they're going to do. And uh, in a really rugged division, that will be a feat. Every season doesn't have to end with a Lombardi for it to feel successful. I think the Steelers have had quietly some successful seasons as they build to this point. Now it's time to make a little bit more hay than what they've made. For sure. Yeah, I'm just curious here. You know, I I have to imagine one of the the hot takers somewhere is going to sleep tonight and it's percolating in the brain. The Steelers are four and two. Kenny Pickett hasn't looked that great at quarterback. They've got some issues. Mike Tomlin, maybe he should be atop that list. But uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Obviously, a lot more has to play. Out. I can't imagine that, though, really. If you do the math on that, it's fun to think about. But the the Steelers, they would have to win the division, first of all, right? They're, they're, like, the, there's no consideration if you don't at least have a division title, right? Uh, I don't know. I mean, sometimes you just get those, hey, it's the most surprising coach, not necessarily the best coach who wins that award from time to time. But uh, we're going to talk about the division. First, a brief message from Goldberg, Persky, and White. If you were diagnosed with mesothelioma or lung cancer, call your local attorneys at Goldberg, Persky, and White. For more than 40 years, their firms represented thousands of lung cancer and mesothelioma victims. Call 1-800-COMPLEX or visit gpwlaw.com for a free consultation. Oh, and a word from Propel Schools. Propel's 13 public charter schools in Allegheny County build a solid academic foundation for lifelong learning and offer more personalized instruction at every level for your child's kindergarten through 12th grade education journey. Give your children the quality education they deserve, learn more, learn more and apply to Propel Schools by visiting propelschools.org. Yes, Dave, let's zoom out a bit now on the AFC North. Even on a day that the Steelers played a, a pretty good all-around game by their standards, especially towards the towards the stretch run when you consider the opponent going on the road, what have you one of their better wins of the year. Um, the Ravens and Browns arguably have even better days. Uh, you know, this AFC North division is is strange. You know, the, the Ravens, they can't get out of their own way against the Steelers and lose. They almost botch it in similar fashion against the Titans, and then they just go and blow the doors off the Lions. And all the Browns did was put up 39 points and, and squeak by the Colts with P.J. Walker at, at quarterback. And then you have the Bengals, who – On top of all that, the two-time reigning division champs probably have the best roster on paper in this division, and yet they were off this week, but they're alone in last place at 3-3. I just don't know what to make of any of it at this point, starting with the Steelers. It's it's where we thought it was going to be, though, right, Batco? I mean, there was there you could you could try and talk yourself out of it, but it's a gauntlet for each of those four teams. And the thing that I struggled with all summer was trying to figure out one, two, three, four, and really how you could flip that upside down and it would kind of make sense. No matter. I didn't think the Bengals would be four, though. That's for sure. Well, and 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 how about the fact that their next game is against the Niners? I do though with Cincy. They're one of those teams that we can kind of talk about, like how we want to talk ourselves into, into some things that may or may not be true to make ourselves feel good um, in the here and now about our team. But um, I, th- they have the vibe and they've actually, they just did it a year ago. They, they feel like maybe they could just run off like who the Bengals are in real time. Oh, they won nine in a row. Never wouldn't they surprise the me. Yeah. But the Ravens, I think, I think they're more volatile. I know that now the world has decreed after the game against Detroit that Todd Munkin's offense has taken hold. Lamar gets it. Everybody's on the same page now. The defense really did a great job against Detroit, who'd been beating teams up. And it's hard to deny, based on 
well, I, I've gone through that game a little bit um, today on Monday. Um, it What jumps out at you, Lamar obviously remains special, but is I was surprised by the line of scrimmage movement from both sides. I, th- I thought Detroit's hard to beat. That travels week to week. And by the way, obviously that's what uh, what the Steelers said about doing, Omar Khan and company said about doing over the last 18 months is just getting brawnier to play Philadelphia Eagles or otherwise kind of sure. bully ball. Um, but, I, you know, I don't love the state of their offensive line in Baltimore. I think, you know, there are some longstanding things with Ronnie Stanley, who's the most Im- important member of that O-line. And um, obviously the running back is, I guess, fungible, especially for the <laughs> Ravens. But, you know, they're pretty deep down there already. And, you know, the defense on the back, I, I, I don't like – their safeties are nice when they're both healthy. I don't know. I don't know. Marlon Humphrey maybe is already a little bit past it. And I think they can be had. I don't know that they definitely have a consistent pass rush. Um, and the Browns are funny because their roster is loaded up, but they made the most bronzy move in the history of bronze. And that was getting Deshaun Watson when they didn't have to. And, you know, we can, we can debate whether or not just staying with Baker Mayfield and just, you know, holding it the, at the 21 table and saying like, we're going to hold here and think that this is going to give us a winning hand with the rest of the roster. No, no, they had to push it. They had to go get the Sean Watson. They had to pay him that level of bank. And now the football God seemed to be in way, seemed to be weighing in on all that. The Browns. I hate, I, I hate to say this as a longstanding Steelers fan, but like depending on the Browns to just be the Browns seems uh, is uncomfortable except that they just keep being the Browns. They keep they're they're a dangerous them. team. They're a danger to themselves and others. Like they are, <laughs> they're just so, so strange. Um, I could see like, any, like any Brown season, right? They, I could see this one going either way, but it seems likely that it could go a long way in one direction or the other. I mean, it uh, right. But you know, bottom line. So where does Pittsburgh stand uh, amidst all this uh, Browns to the left of us uh, Ravens <laughs> to the right? Um, here we go. I, you know, this is the time where they really better start cashing in here. You know, two and two sounds okay. Getting the six and four. We know what the trio of games is that awaits them at the back at the very end of the season. It is uh, Cincy and Pittsburgh, then at Seattle, then at Baltimore. We don't know. Maybe Baltimore's playing for nothing. Maybe they're comfortably, right. you know, have won the division and it's their backup QB and nothing to worry about there. But that's a tough stretch. So, in the here and now, they 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 really have to stack wins, as the kids say, and Coach T likes to say. Now's the time for that to happen. Um, and you know, I I do think the roster. I'm a little, I'm surprised, and I think this big overreaction or reaction, at least, to Matt Canada. How many coordinators in the history of people does everybody in the country know? Everybody did any, knows did Matt chant Canada. That? Were there any chants yesterday at SoFi? I, I didn't hear one. Okay. No. Didn't hear a one of them, and it was refreshing. Um, I get it. He he ain't the he ain't the right guy, but I can yeah. see the math that led them to keeping Kenny Pickett. I've been mean, ke- keeping Matt Canada for Kenny Pickett to this point. I assume a change is coming unless they do win eleven games, and then it'll be hard to to push back on that. Um, but you know, the roster hasn't the offensive line specifically. I know Cam Hayward's down still getting gashed on occasion in the run. That ain't great. The Devante um, Adams game when they were in Vegas and they simply could not cover Devante Adams. And they won that game largely because Josh McDaniels and Jimmy G decided for some reason to not just throw the ball to Devante Parker, every single play that was available to you. And that would have been a victory. Maybe Joey Porter Jr. Changes that a little bit going forward. It certainly seems like it has uh, realigned them and made them a little bit better on the back end, um, early returns at least on that. But it comes down to Ken Pickett, though. So I'm unsatisfied. I thought the roster was better than where it was going to be. I think Deontay Johnson and George Pickens are musts. They are not luxury items for Kenny Pickett. Both those guys have to be on the field for this offense to thrive. And when they're out there, I, I have no answer for the bizarre Kenny Pickett of three quarters. It is the opposite of Clayton Kershaw. This <laughs> thing of this guy struggle with pressure. Okay. I don't mean uh, inside pressure in your, I mean, I mean, you know, the emotional, the heart, the right. spiritual kind of pressure. 
um, of this is a big spot. I hope I'm up for it. <laughs> uh, kind of, kind of pressure. And I think that, um, you know, the perception of clutch is like, boy, he rises in the big spots. No, no. Most g- clutch guys just maintain their level and that's enough to win games. Cause a lot of guys do crumble in that spot and get tight. Kenny Pickett actually elevates. I don't yeah. know how that's possible, but he actually <laughs> plays better than he does most of the time. It's the equivalent of like the, the Popeye spinach thing. It really is weird. <laughs> what in hell's going on there? More of that. I mean, I know the joke is, Hey, Mike Tomlin, tell him it's the first quarter. Uh, tell him it's the fourth quarter at kickoff and see if it tricks the kid. I don't know what's going on here. I have no answers for it, but if you can get, more of that picket over the course of 60 minutes. It, he doesn't have to be flawless. What he has to be is not turnover prone. He ultimately, you want to have Kenny Pickett's game versus the one Matt Stafford has. Matthew Stafford, to me, I'm curious what you think about this. To me, Matthew Stafford delivered a Hall of Fame performance on Sunday against the Steelers, and he has added a great late chapter to his Hall of Fame bid, except for that pick. Pickett didn't throw one of those picks. There's your difference in the game, right? Pretty simple, I know, but but still true. Yeah, I mean, Stafford was really good. He's been really good all season. McVay actually took some of the, the mm-hmm. brunt of the blame um, on that pick, and I thought it was interesting. I was going back through the Rams postgame pressers, and it's just one of those reminders of, like, every team has problems and stuff that when you right. lose, it can probably get blown out of proportion, like – Stafford was asked about it. He was like, I don't really want to go into the specifics. Like basically like I didn't see him good, good play by TJ Watt and McVay gave like a three paragraph long answer about like every single route, every guy was running and why it shouldn't have worked out that way. So um, if that happened here, uh, we'd be, we'd be analyzing it to death why they're uh, kind of on different pages with their answers. But I, I think that the Rams might be okay. Stafford might be okay, but yeah, you're right with Pickett. as far as how to explain it. I guess the, uh, you know, the glass half empty uh, explanation would be it's kind of sheer randomness. It's a small, smallish sample size. And over time, it's going to level off to show that, you know, he's closer to the mediocrity that we see for three quarters than, again, the unexplainable magic at the end. But obviously the Steelers hope that there's that intangible factor there to him uh, that he'll be able to get that. You know, they'll be able to get that out of All right, what's your bet? Minutes All right, bet, Co. That's a, that's your new brand when you give out uh, wagers. It's got to be bet co. That's or bet or bet ko. I guess ten percent off your first uh, something your like first that. Bet. All right, <laughs> let's go. Let's go long term prop here. And there's no way we'll actually be able to divine the answer to this. But in I mean we can't wait five years. We have to wait year three. It's fair to expect him to be ripe and ready to roll. And if he is the real deal, that is enough time to make a deep playoff run. Bet co. Here we go. First one ever. Prop bet on Batco's program. Here we go. Kenny Pickett. Is he a top 12 QB, a difference-making QB, good enough to win a couple of playoff games in January? Mm, I don't think so. I don't think mm. I've seen enough to to make that wager just yet, Mr. Damashek. Uh, you know, I, I think the physical traits and some of the just natural gifts maybe aren't quite there for him to ever reach that tier. But as some guys age out, maybe it would take really sitting down at a coffee table and going through the 12 best QBs in the league. Although there are some Ooh, young I like studs that. right now in it. Uh, you know, speaking of the guy who beat him heads up in week four in Houston. And, you know, when you project out even a year or two down the road, I think there's going to be some really good players coming into the NFL at that position as well. No including doubt. one that I watched Saturday night at the LA Coliseum in person in Caleb Williams, obviously it was not a good night in the end for the USC Trojans. But my main takeaway from that game was, Caleb Williams, pretty good. USC defense, pretty bad. But now we're getting on a little bit of a tangent. I well, I do want to hear now that we've touched on it, the, your your LA experience. I'm obviously here. I, you know, I moved out here years ago as a Lemuist to spread the good word. You know, people skit on me like, you love Pittsburgh. Why didn't you, why didn't you make your career there? And I said, because I have important words to spread. People don't know that Lemieux is better than Gretzky. And you're a missionary. Better to, I'm going to go to LA and let those people there know about it and spread the word from spread the word out from there. But what did you, what did you think of SoFi? What did you think of Ice Cube playing at halftime? Very different than um, who was it? What was her name? Uh, who came out at halftime of the uh, 2001 AFC title game? <clears throat> like, Hey, how you doing Pittsburgh? And people are like, boo. <laughs> I, I don't uh, remember off the top of my head, but Wiz Khalifa did do a, uh, a, oh, that's a good one. In-game okay. concert last year. So, you know, Pittsburgh's got some tricks. 
Um, SoFi was really cool. Very difficult stadium to navigate. I usually like to walk the concourse pregame just to kind of get a feel for uh, mm-hmm. the place and just en- enjoy life a little bit instead of sitting in the stoic press box with empanadas. But I couldn't even figure out how to do it at SoFi because there's so many levels. There's escalators. There's people checking your tickets. There's ushers telling me I can't stand there. So um, so that was a little strange. But just once you get in your seat and you're sitting there, uh, it's pretty awesome. And unfortunately, in the press box, you can't really hear uh, the the noise from out there. So I didn't get you know, no ice cube really in my ears, unfortunately. I don't I like that. Kabali, that. I've argued with this about him, your peer group in Pittsburgh. I don't understand who decided this. You know, people understand that Cope used to enjoy a drink during the game, right? It wasn't a sin. Like the world kept spinning. It was a sporting event after all. There weren't, there weren't uh, uh, global uh, affairs to be dealt with. It was a right. No nuclear codes. Why give me a, to- a Harry Carey? Now it's a sin to make noise in a press box. And and you know what? I don't know where you come down back of, but I can tell you this. I know that that Kabali fellow likes to likes to say like, well, that's unprofessional to make noise. I say, well, then call me unprofessional because I'm making noise if my team makes a play in the press box, and I'll deal with all the stink eyes. I've done it at Super Bowl <laughs> 45. I was spoken to, in fact. In the in the press box, it was my first year at the NFL, and I and I had the temerity to cheer a Steelers touchdown, and I was I was quickly spoken with that that sort of behavior, not acceptable. Yeah. I would have just been wrap. I would have just been wrapping along to uh, today was a good day, I guess probably if, if I had the inclination <laughs> to get to get a little bit louder. But uh, no, yeah, it was it was a good trip. Fortunately, I I've got some friends out there, so uh, met nice. up with some people in Santa Monica, and then like I said, went to the USC game. With one of them, that was cool. My my laptop kind of short circuited in the press box after the game. That was not as cool. I actually had to write my post game story on my phone. So that's what downs. they do. That's what yeah. they do. At the the Rams do that. They they're wired in when they're they're plugged. Big Brother just shuts down your laptop if they're if you're writing about a Rams loss. Yeah. That, Did you notice what I noticed? What I this was a I I maybe somebody's going to disprove and they're going to feel like an ass, but I could swear that they did not show. I was I was looking periodically. Afternoon games. Oh, Seattle. Okay, okay. They're going to end up taking care of Josh Dobbs and company up in Seattle. And I realized, like, wait a second. What is that Chiefs and Chargers score? And then I realized, oh, they don't they don't uh, uh, acknowledge that the Chargers exist in SoFi when the Rams are playing there. Isn't that funny? Yeah, yeah. That, that's It is pretty impressive, though, on that note of how much stuff they have to, like, swap out and do uh, <laughs> to, to, to transition that stadium yeah. from one to the other. Uh, as frequently as they do. But, uh, well, hey, Dave, I think that's all I've got for you. Really appreciate you working with me on our East Coast, West Coast schedules and dad duties to get this done. Do you have any parting words or any plugs you'd like to plug before I let you go? Uh, I appreciate it. I think you hit them all. If you're somebody who cares about predictions in advance of the actual games, we do every Friday on minus three at 4 p.m. Eastern. We do the 15-minute pregame show. We give you every score um, in the NFL for that week. And it's only 15 minutes. I don't know who decided like 10, 20 years ago, the pregame show should be three and four hours and involve the saccharine backstories of, of the superstars and where they came from. Like nice stories, just not right before the game. I want to know who's going to win the game. So that's why we do this show for those people. So check that one out, but, uh, great fun and, uh, honored to join you back. Go big fan of your work and have been for the last few years. And, uh, and keep it up, and let, let's let's try to enjoy the journey, everybody. We don't know where this is going to wind up. Probably not with a Lombardi and Ken Pickett's hand. Like, well, I don't even know. He'd have to use two hands to get that thing up over his head anyhow. No, the glove, the, the glove could – he'd be fine with the glove. Oh, it's sticky? There, okay, good. Yeah. You could just throw it to, to Pickens, and he'll do it. <laughs> and then he'd probably spike it and get retroactive. 15-yard penalty, yeah. play the last quarter all over again. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Uh, you know, please do keep in mind uh, in a couple of weeks, the great Yinzer tailgate is bringing the best of the Berg to South Point, November 4th, showcasing Pittsburgh's rich culture, iconic sports history and vibrant community spirit. The great Yinzer tailgate. It'll immerse you in the unique blend of traditions that make Pittsburgh legendary. Visit www.thegreatyinzertailgate.com for details. Thanks again to our pal, Dave Damashek. He's the man. I'm Brian Badko. This has been The Chip Tam and Football Show. We'll see each other again very soon. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Apple Podcast channel for more podcast content. Click below for a special deal of 99 cents for a three-month subscription to the Pittsburgh Post Gazette.